Let's move on to the Houthis. Uh, this is one where, Ryan, I'm really going to rely on you for this. I will just kick things off with a uh, really funny clip um, from the Pentagon where Pentagon reporters, who are smart, they're like, hey, so are we at war in the Middle East? They keep asking them this yeah. needling question. You guys bombed three countries yesterday, so what's going on? And the Pentagon just continue to beclown itself and say, no, we're not at war in the Middle East, even though, yes, we did bomb three countries yesterday. Let's take a listen. Well, Carla, we, we've been working for a very long time on regional security and stability, not only in the Middle East, but around the world. And so we'll continue to work very closely with allies and partners globally uh, to address tensions uh, in the Middle East. You know, since uh, Hamas's attack against Israel, of course, we've been very focused on deterrence and on preventing a wider regional conflict, and we'll stay focused on that. And what about his words on the brink? Is the U.S. on the brink of war right now in the Middle East? Uh, we are not at war in the Middle East. Clearly, there are significant tensions in the Middle East. And again, we're working closely with allies and partners to de-escalate and reduce those tensions where we can, recognizing the fact that, uh, you know, others have a vote as well. Okay, got it. Very yeah. clear. We're going to keep de-escalating tensions with these bombs. It seems obvious to me he doesn't want to say we're at war because legally we're not at war. And Can't, legally, yeah. Congress is the one who is supposed to authorize war. The, the best one was on Tuesday. Uh, one of the many countries that we bombed was Somalia. Mm -hmm. And the uh, AFRICOM put out a statement announcing the bombing and said, in an act of self-defense, yes. uh, U.S. forces bombed Al-Shabaab militants. Like self-defense? Mm -hmm. You flew... You flew halfway around the globe just to bomb people in Somalia, and you're going to pretend to tell us that this was about self-defense. Mm -hmm. Maybe you needed to do that. Maybe these were the worst people on the planet, and it's, and it's wonderful that your, your bombs you know, blew them to smithereens. But let's not pretend that this had anything to do with self, imminent self-defense. Yeah, and you, right. had, uh, you had Mike Lee, Todd Young, uh, Chris Murphy and Tim Kaine, who are, mm -hmm. you know, these are some, you know, serious. Very across the. Yeah, yeah across yeah, the board yeah. here. This is not, this is not Bernie right. uh, <laughs> teaming up here with anybody. Uh -huh. Writing to the White House saying, if these are, you, that you have the right to respond I immediately in a self-defense capacity. Obviously, there's a, a ship somewhere, there's a boat coming at it or a missile coming at it. You, mm -hmm. you can take action against that threat. Nobody says you need to, like, get a declaration of war to Congress uh, before you can stop a, a speedboat, you know, with, with explosives attached to it. If you are in prolonged hostilities that you have entered yourself into, you need authority. Even Ben Cardin, uh, who's as close to uh, the White House, as hawkish as, as you can get, mm -hmm. uh, said that they, if they're going to continue this, they're going to need to get on, on sounder legal footing. Like, so across the board, people are recognizing that, th that this is not really sustainable. I love hearing from the, the Defense Department because the, the words that they use are so just the opposite of what we understand right. them to mean. Well, they're all couched in legality. So like you said, U.S. forces have the authorization to act in self-defense basically anywhere, and they can and, do anything that they want and, to. That's they, why they say it all the time. And they keep saying that we yeah. really don't want the uh, the war to spread. We want we want the hostilities to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. And the way their argument, to, to give them as much credit as possible, is that, de that deterrence is the thing that is going to de-escalate. And the way that you get your deterrence is by dropping bombs everywhere because then everybody's scared of you and, and they're going to retreat. Problem for them is that there's no evidence that Iran or its proxies are deterred uh, by the fact that we have lots of bombs. To that, uh, to that, Ryan, there was an interesting thing I wanted to get your take on. Let's put this up there on the screen where the U.S. is currently asking China to help bail it out of the Red Sea Incredible. attacks. It says the U.S. has asked China to urge Tehran to rein in the Houthi rebels. According to American officials, they have repeatedly raised the issue with top Chinese officials in the past three months. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and others actually spoke directly to the head of the Chinese Communist Party's international department. So did the Secretary of State. And yet there has been zero Chinese pressure so far. What do you make of this? Is it an admission of diplomatic failure? Yes. Is it, I mean, I, I personally think it's just humiliating because you have your main geopolitical rival and you're going to them and you're like, hey guys, this is bad for you too. <laughs> and they're like, is it? They're like, cause I'm raking in yes. cash. You know, I'm like, you're the, your carriers, the ones who are paying all these extra prices, euros, you guys are the ones paying for the inflation. They're like, we're sitting here pretty. We're actually doing fine. The, the yeah. fact that this idea ever got off the State Department uh -huh. whiteboard shows <laughs> just how bankrupt and out of ideas they are. So 
it, it, we could count the layers of absurdity here. First of all, the Houthis have actually, uh, they, the Houthis are warning ships before they fire on them, and the Houthis have told Russia and China that they're not going to attack Russia, Russian and Chinese ships as long as those ships are not going to Israeli ports. Right. We don't talk about that here in the United States because mm. we pretend that the Houthis are, are uh, a, a kind of nihilistic gr bunch of pirates mm -hmm. who are just doing these, thi these mean things to these ships for no reason. Russia and China are both aware of what Houthi the Houthis' regional interests are and what their global interests are and what their domestic interests are, and it's not to attack Chinese and Russian ships. So, chi so wh why are the Chinese and Russians uh, so concerned about it? Now, so some of, a lot of Chinese goods operate on you know, U.S.-linked ships. So that's where the U.S. thinks, okay, China's having a problem here because now shipping costs are going up. So you're seeing Suez Canal traffic just absolutely plummet. That's raising prices of shipping. Mm -hmm. The State Department thinks to itself, okay, well, now the Chinese are upset because they're spending a little bit more uh, for shipping costs. Th that, that's absurd the, the, because you know, China is sitting on you know, mountains of our cash. Uh, the, for geopolitical advantage, they're constantly spending that money, and they're they're okay to take a little tiny hit if if it is causing us as much geopolitical uh, damage as it is. So right off the bat, there, there's no reason to think that the Chinese are going to bail us out uh, because we're getting hurt worse uh, by it uh, than than they are. The the maybe third or fourth layer of absurdity is that China, first of all, Tehran does not run the Houthis. Tehran has influence over mm -hmm. the Houthis. U.S. has influence over Israel. Israel operates with its own agency Good point. as well. But China does not run Tehran. Mm -hmm. They talk sometimes and they do business. They, they talk, yeah. they have influence. Right. China's a big country that Tehran's gonna listen to, absolutely. China's on the phone. Mm -hmm. the, the Iranian The Ayatollah, guy, gonna, yeah, he's gonna pick he, it up. He's taking right. that call. He's leaving right. whatever meeting he's gonna take that call. That does not mean that he's going to do whatever China asks him mm -hmm. to do. Good point. Yeah, I think all of this, you know, is, as we always say, you know, it's not like the Houthi thing came out of a vacuum. A lot of it stems back to Israel. And this is where the interesting point about Israeli pressure domestically for a ceasefire may be increasing. Let's put this up there. We gave some of the preview of this the last time that we did a show together, Ryan, about these Israeli mm -hmm. hostage families that crashed into this Knesset meeting. But this time, you know, it's getting really starting to get attention internally. And they say here, the Israeli hostage families, quote, have nothing to lose in this push for a new deal. And the new deal uh, that the Israeli government, the war cabinet had approved, was a release of all hostages in exchange for a two month ceasefire. Doesn't seem that it's being you know widely entertained, but clearly there's a lot of pressure because you have 132 hostages who remain in captivity. They say 28 of them are believed to have been dead, either of injuries of Hamas or uh, claimed to have been killed by Israeli troops currently in the situation. But in general, it does seem that many of these families have, quote, now mounted large-scale demonstrations, met with officials, and are papering the entire country with posters, including traveling abroad to try and uh, drum up mm. global awareness. What do you make of that pressure inside of Israel and what effect it might have here on the Houthi situation? I think po politically speaking, oh, and one complication that also never gets mentioned in the press that we should yeah. let our uh, viewers into is that Hamas does not actually have all of these hostages. Mm -hmm. Like, Hamas has released a lot of uh, the civilian ones, what's remaining are mostly uh, you know, uh, so soldiers IDF, and other- reservists, et cetera, yeah, police But officers, a yeah. bunch of gangs and thugs and, and other groups mm -hmm. went over the border on October 7th and have some. We don't know, nobody knows how many, but it, it absolutely is some and a non-trivial number. And so it's not even clear that Hamas, mm. and, and Hamas may be embarrassed in, in that sense because you know they're supposed to have total control. So you mean like criminal gangs, Palestinian Islamic Jihad? Like that, and they might not yeah. even like- know where they are or have mm. the capacity. Like it, Hamas could reach a deal with Qatar, or reaches a deal with Israel, and then Hamas might not be able to deliver on some of these. Wow, so some of that is embarrassing for them. Right. Um, but separately, from the Israeli government perspective, I feel like they had, they have, politically, they have two options. You know, they can reach a deal that uh, releases the hostages, or they can achieve their military objectives of annihilating Hamas wiping out the Palestinians and kind of basically repopulating it with Israeli settlements, which you hear from so many of the far-right members of the, of the current Israeli government. They are clearly failing at that first one. Like Hamas is not eliminated. Uh, their, their, their efforts to clear buffer zones just mm -hmm. the other day led to 21 is, uh, Israeli casualties. And so I think from, from an Israeli public that is saying, okay, you're not accomplishing your primary objective if you were, 
then maybe we could understand what you said in the beginning, that you were going to be ruthless with the hostages. But if you're not accomplishing your military objective, then just get the hostages back. Like, you no longer have an excuse to refuse to negotiate over these hostages. And, and they, so they, they came forward with this two-month ceasefire offer uh, where there'd be a pause, they release all the hostages, there'd be some release of Palestinian hostages, and then the hostilities would resume. Mm -hmm. And Hamas, and I think a lot of Palestinians are like, so in two months, like, are, are you gonna let in enough humanitarian aid? Like, it's, it's not an end to this crisis. And then uh, we've lost our bargaining chip and then you're just, going to just continue, you know, carpet bombing the place. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.